I'm going to show you how to use CoCalc to run Jupyter Lab in the cloud on um, either in a CoCalc project, so that's on our shared resources, or on a dedicated compute server where you pay as you go and you have access to either a large number of CPUs, memory, or a GPU, your choice. So first, sign into CoCalc, and this is what it will look like. And once you're signed in, click on your projects. And I have a project called Demos set up here. It doesn't have any files in it or anything. What I'm going to do first is launch Jupyter Lab in this project. So it's really just one click right here. Click that button and then in the background in this project that's running, it will start an instance of Jupyter Lab. Once it starts running, it will proxy our connection to Jupyter Lab, and we'll see it pop up in another tab. And here we are. So um, these are the kernels that are pre-installed by default in CoCalc. There's lots and lots of different kernels. Um, let's grab, let's just play around for a second with the Python one, and I'll draw a plot. using PyLab, and there we are. Um, some things to note, anyone who's a collaborator on your project will be, and you can add anyone you want by just adding their email address, they will be able to equally uh, use this Jupyter Notebook. However, uh, there's no um, by default support for real-time collaboration. So you have to be careful and do the same sort of uh, coordination that you would normally do with Jupyter Lab. This is just Jupyter Lab running. Uh, you can see that the file, by the way, is also visible in CoCalc itself. And you can also open the notebook there if you want. And you'll see it's there as well. Um, this will make Jupyter Lab unhappy, but you can also use it here. If you use it inside of CoCalc, you do have real time collaboration. But if you use it from Jupyter Lab, you have um, some nice advantages. Namely, any Jupyter extension will work. And you have like the entire ecosystem of Jupyter. And of course, the user interface is extremely familiar and standard to people who have used Jupyter Lab a lot. OK, next, let's suppose that instead of just wanting to use the very limited resources in a single CoCalc project, we like to run Jupyter Lab, but we like a little bit more computational power. So what I'll do is I'll click Servers, and then I'll click Create Compute Server. Here um, I'll use uh, Google Cloud, so this is a demo, and then I will choose a machine. They have some really interesting machines. Uh, let's try one of these C3D machines. And let's say we want a lot of CPU. So we'll go with this machine that has 90 CPUs. And once you've selected a machine, if you click on region, it shows you all the regions in the world and what the price is in each of these regions. And notice that uh, US East and Central have the best prices. So we'll just stick with US Central. And we're not gonna do much, let's just stay with this 10 gigabyte disk. Um, you can choose different types of disks and different, um, which have different properties in terms of speed and cost. And this is very important. In order to use Jupyter Lab with Google Chrome, it's critical to set a subdomain. So uh, I'll just call this my Jupyter Lab demo. So you set a subdomain, and then the um, then CoCalc will automatically set up jupyterlab-demo.cocalc.cloud, so that points at our compute server. Okay, and also at the top, we're going to use a spot instance because it costs $1.73 an hour instead of $4.40 an hour. It's just a lot cheaper. Uh, by the way, you can also toggle this switch and then you'll see GPUs. We have A100s, L4s, and T4s if you need a GPU. But let's just start this demo with a CPU. Okay, we click Start. And now it's starting up. Um, this will take 
uh, you know, one to two minutes. And while it's starting up, you can click serial. It doesn't work initially until the machine, it like will keep trying to refresh every th three seconds. But right now it's creating the virtual machine and there's no serial console to actually look at the log for. So we have to wait a little while. But as soon as the machine exists, we'll actually see the boot up sequence. And here it is. This uses um, xterm.js to display and whatever configuration you have set for your terminal normally. So let's just wait and for this you know, massive machine to boot up. So it's actually already booted up and now it's running the startup script. So what this does is it installs some Docker images and configures everything to connect to our CoCalc project. And you can also see the status of that here. So it's mounting the home directory of the project. It's starting up the Docker image. It's syncing the file system and it's almost ready. Okay, it's now ready. So there are a couple of things we can do with our compute server, uh, but what we're gonna do is run JupyterLab. So there's a quick way to do that. You just click on this button right here. Um, alternatively, there's a little menu in the upper right where you can click and then run JupyterLab that way. Either way is the same. So I'm just going to click on the Jupyter button. Boom. And what it's now doing is starting up JupyterLab running on our compute server. It's checking every few seconds to see if JupyterLab is fully running or not. And as soon as it starts running, it pops up JupyterLab in another tab. And now let's wait. It's loading. It's continuing to load. You should see a little boop. There it is. So JupyterLab is now loaded. Woohoo! Okay. Um, the interesting thing though is this is running on a completely different computer thousands of miles away from this other Jupyter Lab, even though we're looking at the same file. Um, to illustrate that, let's make a terminal in Jupyter Lab. Okay, here we are. I know I'll type top, and notice that if I hit one, actually it's better to use H top because you can really see there's an enormous amount of CPUs in this machine. Whereas if we go over here, um, notice there's a lot of kernels because there's a huge amount installed into CoCalc, but when you type H top, this is not a very powerful computer. Um, if you do cat proc CPU, well, you can't even see. Basically, there's not a lot going on here in terms of power. There's four CPUs, and it's actually in a sandbox that so things are very limited. So this running on our compute server, it's extremely powerful, whereas the other one isn't. However, um, the file system is the same. See, these are the two files, and over here, we see the same files, except um, on the compute server, you have a special directory, compute server 3238. This is a fast local directory that doesn't exist anywhere except on the compute server. It's not synchronized back to the main project. So this is the sort of place where you might drop, you know, 100 gigabytes of files, whatever. Notice that it should have, uh, it's a 10 gigabyte disk. There's 3.9 gigabytes available. By the way, if you need more space there, it's very easy. Just go back to your compute server. Um, click on settings, scroll down to the disk right here. You know, instead of 10 gigs, let's say I want a terabyte of disk space. Click a button, and now let's go back and look. I didn't have to reboot my compute server. I don't have to mess around with the command line to enlarge any file systems. Let's just go back and look. And within a few seconds, I now have a terabyte of disk space available right here, ready to go on this very fast local file system. And of course you can, um, you know, make notebooks there, or do whatever you want. And it's not synchronized around, so you can put lots and lots of data there. Okay. Um, and just to illustrate, let's just try a little, a tiny little benchmark from time import time, sum range 10 to the eight. Uh, time, or let's see, t equals time, time minus t. 
So we're running that on the compute server. And now let's run the same thing in the CoCalc project. Let's see what happens. So see it's 1.57 seconds in the CoCalc project, whereas in the compute server, it's significantly faster. And also we have access to an enormous amount of compute power. Uh, in addition to all that, you can, of course, access everything directly here. For example, if I just, uh, if I switch this to the compute server, I'm now browsing files directly on the compute server. And I can do things like make a terminal there. And um, there it is. And then when I do top, I see all of these CPUs. Okay, so when you're done using your compute server, you'll want to shut it off. And you can do that by, you can click stop if you want to keep your data, or you can click settings and then deep revision if you don't have any special data that's only on the compute server. So let's click deep revision. So we're done. And this will shut it down. Also, while it's running, if you click on upgrades and scroll down, you see every purchase related to this project specifically. And um, you'll see like the running purchase for network and it costs 17 cents for this monster compute server that I was just using. So you can see that running as well. Okay, so that concludes our demo and we're done.